sitting here today, downtown Toronto, getting to chat with one of my favorite chefs, restaurateur, entrepreneur. You're so inspiring. I'm so glad you, I got to chat with you today. Vikram Vich, everyone. My pleasure. Namaste. Namaste. I'm honored. And a fellow Punjabi too, so that's <laughs> exciting. So, Hindu Punjabi, Punjabi Hindu from Amritsar, it doesn't matter, but an Indian at heart. What do you eat when you go to Amritsar? You know, there's nothing about me that's low fat, right? I eat everything that's delicious. I eat on side streets. Mm -hmm. I eat in people's homes. But one of my favorite things is the gehwe kulche, wow. which is a little piece of bread that's got spicy chickpeas on top with onions, and, and they're hot and they're spicy, just like the festival that I'm going to be doing on Saturday. So when we talk hot and spicy, how do you differentiate? Like, how do you tell people, oh, it's hot, but it's not, it's not spicy. This is spicy, but it's not hot. Yeah. Well, Indian food uh, traditionally is supposed to be that you taste it and your palate is fine. Nothing's burning. You're good. But by the time you're finished with your two rotis, you should have a little sweat on your forehead, a little sweat here, and you should feel that heat coming from inside out. Why? Because our spices, like the cloves and the cinnamon and ginger, they produce heat from inside. Because countries like India, that are so close to the equator, eat hot food because they want to expel the heat. The, the countries that are away from the equator, like Germany and Scandinavia, they retain the heat. So they'll eat foods that retain heat. We eat foods that expel heat out of your body because it cools you down. And so when I tell people that you're eating hot food or spicy food, I say it's a myth that your palate should be on fire. Your palate should not be on fire. Your palate should be beautiful, it should be comfortable, but by the time you're finished, you should be like, hmm, I can feel a little glow on my forehead. I can feel a little sweat on my back. That's proper Indian food. And traditionally, that's what it's supposed to be. Warm and happy. Warm and happy and flavorfully delicious. Your, your body should not be in discomfort because of that. So when you talk about spices, say this weekend you decide to go camping, <coughs> and you can only take a few choice items with you. Which spices would you take? Well, obviously, I'll take the haldi mm -hmm. because that's that's antiseptic. So, especially with camping, you need haldi that has great medicinal value to that. So, cumin seeds for sure because they give that little saltiness, that pungent that you would need. And for sure, I'll I'll take some garam masala with me because that garam masala will finish off my dish without having to add the heat. So it'll produce the heat. In span camping, when you're hot, you want to have something that's not chilly hot but flavorfully spicy. So the, the layers of your cooking are, would you say they're heavily dependent on the spices and the different spices you use? Well, you know, Indian food starts with a beautiful masala. Mm -hmm. Masala is onions, ginger, garlic, tomatoes, and then you build your layers on it. It's the foundation of it. A masala is what a tomato sauce is to an Italian, is what masala is to us. You know, and in Punjabi we call it turka. Right? We start with that and then we build on that. Now, my own cooking has always been not the ingredients itself, but the timing of when I put the ingredient in, when the cumin goes in, when the fenugreek goes in. Because if you actually take all the spices and just put them in there, it'll taste like muddy waters, <laughs> you know? It's terrible. But once you put it in and you give them the spices the time to cook, then you realize that uh, the food is delicious and tasty. So the analogy is a little bit like musical notes, you know? Okay. For me, my spices are like my notes to me. If I played all the notes at the same time, there would be no song, there would be no music. You need to play that music, you need to play that song with individual notes. That's how you do cooking. Cooking always has to be like uh, a palette of color in front of you with all the spices in front of you and your canvas is your pot and you paint. If you took all the paints and just put them on the thing, uh, on, on a canvas, it'll, it'll make no sense. But when you do it layered and layered and you let this dry and you see the color, you walk away, you smell, 
In my case, I go and grab a glass of wine while I'm waiting for the sauteing to happen. Mm -hmm. um, I usually drink a bottle of wine while I'm cooking, and I'll drink a bottle of wine while I'm eating. I'm pretty happy. You like your wine? Yeah, no, I'm pretty happy by the time I've actually started my <laughs> dinner. I'm in a good mood, good yeah. place. That's good. That's, you have to. When you eat, I think you should enjoy it. Absolutely. And at the end, you want that euphoric state. Yeah, and, and enjoy, food should be not just eat because you are hungry. Food should be enjoyed as, as savory and, and delicious. And, and I really do believe that food is the foreplay. Well, I don't know whether you can put that. You can put that on there. <laughs> but um, we'll see. We'll, we, editing is fun. So, what is the right time to add garam masala? Does it change per recipe? So garam masala should always be added <clears throat> when your onions and ginger and garlic are nice and hot because you cook them, ground them nicely. Then you put the garam masala in it. Okay. And then you turn it down. So you've gone from high heat to medium heat and in that time the garam masala has started giving out its own flavors. Why is it done that way? I don't know. My grandmother taught me that. There is no science to it. And I sometimes you don't argue with your grandmother. Tadi used to say, now, the, now that you've added the garam masala, turn the heat down. Just stuck in my head, <laughs> followed it, worked, and here we are. And here we are, and it's been an amazing journey for you. Can you tell me a little bit about the first, your first inkling or your first inclination towards cooking? Uh, first inclination was from day one. My grandfather uh, used to love his scotch, and I think it follows through the grandson as well. He used to love his scotch, and he used to sit in the veranda in India <coughs> and uh, smoke cigarettes at the time. You know, it was totally acceptable to smoke in front of your family members. Yeah. And uh, he would say to me every night that, Vikram, when you grow up, I want you to open up a restaurant one day. And I used to say, why? And he used to say, because uh, when you open up a restaurant, I want to be the bartender of the restaurant. Because he knew as an Indian grandson, I could not charge him for alcohol. <laughs> so he would be, and he said, you love to cook and eat, and I love to drink. It's a perfect combination. Let's open up a restaurant together. And so the name Vidges is actually nothing to do with Vikram Vidj. It has to do to honor my grandfather, Vidj. His name was Roshan Lal Vidj. <clears throat> I always get a little nostalgic Were you about close it. To him? I was very close to him. He was the best alcoholic grandfather you could have ever <laughs> asked for. And he never harmed anybody. He never was upset. He seven o'clock came. He opened up his scotch. He started drinking. He drank till he was totally inebriated. He would go and go to bed. Never bothered anybody. Is that would you say where you get your entrepreneurial spirit? He already saw from a from a very young age that you could team up and make a pretty good team. Right. The entrepreneurial spirit, to be honest with you, came from my father. Okay. My father is a, a very smart businessman and he's a very astute businessman and I love my father, but he's the biggest miser you have ever met. That man doesn't want to spend a penny on a on my food. Like he doesn't even come to my own restaurants because he doesn't want to take a table from a paying customer. Um, but I love him dearly. He's he's my father, and and the the entrepreneurial spirit comes. You see, in India, everybody is an entrepreneur. Even a panwala, a person who, who's on the side streets and selling cigarettes and pan is an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Because we all love to dance to our own music and to our own tune. We want to be free. And when you're an entrepreneur, yes, you're stuck doing things if you have to, but you're still kind of a free spirit. You can do whatever you want. If you don't feel like going in, it's not like a job that you have to show up. Mm -hmm. You're not going to make money. But that's what it is. I don't need to, to do things that I because I have to. I do them because I absolutely love doing what I do. So I don't need to, you know, um, be an entrepreneur. And I think entrepreneurial spirit is something that, that comes into you. You should have that. And I, personally, I think, why would you not want to dance to your own music? Why would you not want to, you know, play your own music and listen to your own tunes? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the most beautiful part about life, is being who you are as a human being and just being totally honest and straightforward with what you believe in and not have to uh, change or mold yourself for anybody. Well, it seems like you've really known what you wanted 
out of life from a very young age. You began your journey at a you know tender age of 19, left home, and who was your first culinary teacher? This is funny. I actually, before I wanted to become a chef, I actually wanted to be a Bollywood actor. No way. I see this. Well, I that wanted to be. Going on, so yeah. you're halfway there now. I <laughs> wanted to be a Bollywood actor, but my father said no. No son of mine is getting entering a film industry because it's like the worst industry. So I had said to myself, what is the next best thing I can do where I can express myself, being who I am? And I said, I am going to open up a restaurant one day. Because there at 7, at 5.30, sorry, there at 5.30, when the curtains are drawn, when the doors are open, mm -hmm. you're there performing. You are there to perform. You can't say, I'm not feeling well. You're there to deliver your lines, you're there to charm people, you're there to, you know, please people, make them feel comfortable. That's what I believe uh, is. So for me, restaurant is not just a business. Restaurant is my stage to perform and show my skills of dancing or singing or whatever I do. And I want people to, to, to uh, you know, be honest and say whether they like the performance or not, whether they like the food or not, and that's what I want. I want people to be honest and straightforward and say, I hated that dish, man. You, you don't have a clue how you made it. It's okay with it. I'm fine with it, as long as it's constructive criticism. Mm -hmm. And from what I hear, your patrons, when they come, you do go out of your way to greet them. You do, you are very hands-on. Um, in the environment, in the restaurant. Is that part of your take on Indian hospitality? You know what, you, you, just, you just said the most important word called Indian hospitality. Because when you're growing up and you hear from your mothers and your grandmothers the stories of a guest in your house is like a god in your house. There is a thing called as Rangoli, which means the painted prayers of India, where that God will look up and come into your house. So we, I grew up with that philosophy that a guest that's come into my house is my God that's coming into the house. So I may be an atheist or an agnostic on one side, but on the other side I worship my customers that come in. And if you worship them, you need to take care of them. And if you need to take care of them, which means you need to come out and talk to them and hold their hands and say, try this, no, try this, try this combination. So I don't run the restaurants as if it's like a business model. I run it as if you come to my house and I'm going to take care of you. That's amazing, and I think that's why people come back. That's why they leave with that great warm feeling in their hearts that, you know what, someone took care of us. And I think you're giving people a taste of Indian home cooking, too, like a homely environment, a warm environment. It's not just home cooking. It's more saying true to who I am, which is I was born in India, so I'm using Indian spices. I was brought up in India, so I'm using layers of Indian spices. But I live most of my life abroad in Austria and, and everywhere else, so here's a nice stemwell to, to match your wines with your food. So what, who I am is what you're getting on the plate. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, and it's a combination of that. Taking care of people is a fundamental right of a human being. Why should you be disrespectful to anybody? Why should you even, you have no right to be, ups, uh, you know, be rude to anybody. But taking care, they've come to your house, they're going to pay for their meals, and you're, you're, you're taking care of your staff, right? You're, you, by their payments, you're able to take care of the staff. That, that, so my, my immigrant ladies in the kitchen um, are my backbone. They are my soul, and I need to take care of my soul, which means I need to make sure that they get paid well, and that's what it is. Well, you touched on the ladies in your kitchen, yeah. and I find it so intriguing that a, a lot of your staff, the, the women, are running the kitchen and in a very male-dominated industry. It, was that important to you? I've never done things because it was like exactly planned. Mm -hmm. I've done things because that's what it feels right. And what actually happened was, when I first hired Amarjeet, my head chef, she said uh, to me, she said, uh, Vikram, we love uh, working together as women. You'll never have an issue with me in the kitchen as long as you don't change this rapport that we have. And I was like, that totally makes sense. Why should I go in and change the formula when the formula is working? Fine. 
So Amarjit goes and hires her own friends and her family and they work well and they make delicious food. So why should I change the formula? So it was never planned that way, it just became that way. It was never like, oh, I'm going to do this. It's the same thing when you're cooking. You never plan your cooking steps. You never say, I'm going to follow this. We are, Indian food especially, is the emphasis of baking. Baking is exact science. Indian food is not exact science. Indian food is whatever you feel like doing today. It's the opposite of that. So when the women come into the kitchen and they work, and they work well, then I just take care of them by making sure that they can eat whatever they want, that they're comfortable, they are happy, and, uh, the, the, and I have not changed the formula. But not because I'm against this, it was never a thought process. It just worked well for me. And sometimes in life, you know, a click like that works in a different direction, takes you to a different level. And that's exactly what happened. Did you always know or feel that this was your purpose? Or did a click in life take you to where you are today? Um, you know, everybody in life has a calling. Everybody in life has a goal. Nelson Mandela had a goal to f get rid of apartheid. Gandhi to free India. Martin Luther Kill King. Martin Luther King to have civil rights. I think my purpose in life was to bring awareness to my cuisine and my culture up. I wanted to showcase that my cuisine is as complex as any other French or Italian or any other cuisine. I wanted people to see and understand that it's Indian cooking is all in your hands. It's just, it's like playing music, you know, you, you pick up the guitar and you start playing beautiful music. That's Indian food. It's not exact science. It's opposite of baking. And I wanted to showcase that the democracy on the plate is Indian food. That's who we are. That's pretty deep. You, you equate your cooking to music and art and I know there's a quote I heard of yours that really spoke to me and you said, food and music will change the world and would end all of our problems. What do you mean by that? I've always said that cuisines and music, not just food, but cuisines, cultural cuisines, intermingling of cuisines, the osmosis of cuisines, whether it's from India to Persia, from Persia to Europe, from Europe to North America, this, this amalgamation, this, this osmosis process, this fusion if you want to call it. So f cuisines and music will solve the problems of the world, not the guns and definitely not the politics. And the reason why I say that or I believe in that is um, because when you sit down and you eat food or a cuisine, you sit together and you break down the barriers. When you listen to music, you have no barriers, whether you're listening to hard rock or soft rock or Indian or classical. You just listen to music. That's what I believe, that if you sat down together and ate and sang music together, you'll never have issues. And this is a, not only just my philosophy, it's a philosophy of the First Nations, the people who lived here first. It's the philosophy of the Indians. If you look at all the tribes, they used to eat together and live together. And that's what I believe in. I seriously believe this. Guns and politics has not solved the problems yet, and nor will it ever. It's the worst thing you can bring in. It's actually, it actually separates, it creates boundaries. Boundaries should not, there should be no boundaries. When a bird flies, it doesn't fly from Canada to the US. We are the only ones who created that boundary. The, the birds don't know where they're going, they're just flying. That's what we should be. We should be like birds. We should be allowed to fly wherever we want and be wherever we want. Free birds. I'm really so intrigued and interested in your philosophies on life and cooking. We're chatting today with Vikram Vidge. And Chef, you're, you have an interesting philosophy on a lot of things. When it comes to you in the kitchen, you're also really big on sustainability, local produce, organic produce. Uh, using the t traditional Indian techniques with what's available to you. Is that someone, something that you sought to do or something that just happened? You know, when you're growing up, you learn a lot of things from who you are as, as a child. And I'm sure you go through that, and I'm sure everybody has a story behind it. I grew up almost like a village mentality. 
and that's what I believe. So sustainability should be equated. <coughs> sorry, sustainability should be e equated to a village mentality, which means somebody grows tomatoes, somebody grows onions, somebody has fish, and somebody has ginger. And then at seven o'clock, seven o'clock they come and they share their wares. Somebody gives you tomatoes, the other one gives you ginger, the other one gives you fish, and you go home and you cook the same curries at home. Mm -hmm. That is sustainability. Sustainability does not mean that uh, you're going to bring in tomatoes all the way from down south mm -hmm. just so that you can have tomatoes there. Sustainability means living within your own means. Whatever your village has produced, you live within yourselves. Whatever your village has, you cook with it. What is it whatever your village drinks, you drink. That's what, so it's a village mentality. Even people say to me, what's local? I always say local is a village. A village form of thinking has to come. Because that will again solve all the other issues. Because nobody can fish, uh, overfish anything, mm -hmm. because they can only bring in that much, because they have the nets that are small. And the ocean gets a chance to replenish itself. Sustainability comes from the fact that you only take what you need on your plate. It's, it's, today people are talking about diets and everything else, right? It's like put your plate and put a little on your plate. Well, that's exactly where it is. Take only what you need. Leave the tomatoes on the wines if you need to. You don't need to pull them out. Take the tomatoes that you need. You bring in 15 tomatoes, you give three to them, three to them, three to them, three to them, and you make a masala out of it. And then the tomatoes get a chance to ripe. The nature gets a chance to replenish itself. When you, and that's what sustainability. Sustainability means living within your means and being a village. That's what to me it means. I'm, I'm not saying it means to everybody. Everybody has a different philosophy of system. That's what means to me. It's like, yeah, I don't need to. Um, I don't need to live outside my means. And you've mentioned while you're enjoying your plate with a little bit of this, a little bit of this, you like to have a glass of wine. And you're also a sommelier. I am. What inspired you to study wines too? When I was, uh, when I'd finished becoming a chef and, and got my chef's papers and everything else and I'd, I'd opened the restaurant up, one of the biggest myths of uh, Indian restaurants was that they would put in a cheap Chardonnay on the menu or they would put in a Pinot Grigio. I mean, when I was single, I could not take a date to an Indian restaurant because I loved wine and it was wine was served by somebody who had no clue. It used to really bother me. I used to say, why can you not have an Indian restaurant that has good wine and food and wine pairings? It's important for me to have that. So I said, okay, well, how do I, how do I change that perception that I know wines? I said, I need to go out and do the sommelier exam. And I went out and I studied. It was an extremely hard exam, extremely hard exam. Uh, took four and a half years and twenty-five thousand dollars to become a sommelier. To become, a sommelier. but my 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 um, passion uh, to pair Indian food with Indian wines and to compare that and to say I know what I'm talking about had to be substantiated by doing this course. It needed to do that. And guess what? It came out of. You know what came out of that whole thing? Out of all that money that I've spent and all that came out of there, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because our spices are so complex that there is not a single sommelier in this world who can taste this wine and say, oh, this is 1967 Silver Oak Cab. Nobody can because our spices are so, so rich. <laughs> what you should be is you take a sip of your wine and it's delicious and you take a bite of your food and that's delicious and that's delicious. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? It's like going on a date. If you get lucky at the end of the night, awesome. If you don't, just go and have fun. That's it. It's okay. not a match made in heaven. The French have it. The Italians have it. Indians, you should drink water. If you really want to match something with Indian food, you should drink water. Or lassi if you want, the, the yogurt drink. That's the classic match. That's the, that's the best match. Are you a sweet lassi or a salty lassi person? Salty lassi. Me too. I am a salty lassi person. Me too. I like the jeera on there. Yeah, the kalanamakanda. <laughs> yes.
Okay, maybe we have to go get Leslie after this. <laughs> um, so, is there a wine that you traditionally or you would recommend to our friends at home watching that they should be pairing with their Indian curry? So, this is what I say. If you are in Niagara and watching this, drink your wines from your own backyard. You know why French got to where they did with that whole hoity-toity of the pairing of this? You know why? Why? Because French was so proud of their own backyard that they said, why should I drink wine from somewhere else when I've got a beautiful Bordeaux right here or I've got Burgundy right here? We as Canadians need to be proud of our own backyard. We need to be proud of the fact that we have beautiful wines, we have sustainable oceans, and we have produce that comes from our backyard. Delicious. Why do you need anything else? What do you need anything else? Why do you need the French wine coming from there? Not against French wines, they do a great job of it. I just believe that if you're, if you're at home, drink your wines from your backyard. Because if we as chefs or, um, or consumers do not support our own backyards, farmers, fishermen, purveyors, winemakers, nobody else will. Who else is going to take care of them? We need to take care of them. We need to be, not, not be arrogant about it. I'm not saying that. You can have your frog rye if you want once in a blue moon, but try to sustain, try to eat what is on your plate that came from your own backyard. Chances are you will learn to love it. We, we need to be proud. We as Canadians should be so proud of this beautiful country. And one of the things I always say to people is I'm so proud that I don't need to be a part of the melting pot. I don't need to change myself. I can wear whatever I want and be totally comfortable in this country. Nobody's gonna judge me. I don't need to care. I'm like this beautiful fabric, a colorful fabric in this beautiful mosaic of, of tapestry that Canada has created. Why should I change? I'm glad that I'm not just one tone carpet. I am a multicultural, and that's who I am. And so it's important for us as chefs, as consumers, as owners to support each other in our backyard. Part of being a sommelier is tasting. Part of being a chef is tasting all yeah. the time, always tasting. And you become better by tasting more. Yeah. Is a palate something that you can actually enhance over time? Or is it something you're born with? You know what, that's a great question. It really is a smart question. I'm not saying this just because <laughs> you're on camera. It's, a smart, it's been, not many people have asked me that question. And I've always wondered when that question comes. So thank you, Anjali. Right, right now. Yeah. Thank you, Anjali. Palette gets trained by tasting and tasting and knowing. My curries that I made in 1994 are different than the curries that I make in, in 2016 because I've gotten more and more comfortable and aged. The dish that I'm going to make on this Saturday, which is the Vijay's family chicken curry, has completely changed from when it actually started. Even my mother looks at it and says, what part of this Vijay's family chicken curry is similar to what I used to make? And I say, mom, but it's evolved. 26 years have gone by, things have changed. You gotta start eating my curry rather than me eating your curry all the time. It's time for me to take care of you. And so, uh, it, you, you, your palates evolve. They mature, they change, and you evolve. Your body changes, your mind changes, right? The, I used to, before, always drink a bubble first, then a glass of white, a glass of red, and finish with a cognac. That was the classic gamut of mine when I, when I was studying first. Now, I just say, you know what, I just want a glass of wine, and I'll have one or two glasses of white and then one or two reds. I don't drink the cognac anymore. I don't drink a bubble beforehand. Just my palate changes, minds change, your setting changes, where you are, what you do changes. I used to smoke pipe when I was a kid. I was a kid, I was 24 years old. I used to belong to a pipe smoking club where we used to sit there and smoke pipe and talk about tobacco and say, this smells a little peaty and all that stuff. Like it was beautiful, I loved it. You know, this typical European, I was the youngest guy who belonged to this club at the time, a pipe smoking club. Um, and now I don't do that anymore because I've changed. So palettes evolve, change, mature, and that's life. We've been talking about how your palettes change over time, how you're, you've kind of enhanced and grown as a chef and in your art form. 
it's a really tough business. It's such a hard thing to establish yourself in a kitchen and you have to pay your dues. Do you have any advice for people who are starting out who look up to you? Um, <clears throat> this, is, this is a talk that I'm going to have on Saturday when, when I'm at the Hot and Spicy Festival. Because nothing should come to you on a silver platter. And I've said this over and over again is I became a chef, you can call me a chef. I became a sommelier, you can call me a sommelier. But don't call me either a celebrity or a VIP. Because I haven't gone to school to become that. I have not, I, I have not earned, I've earned that by respect. Respect me for what I've done. And respect only comes by sheer hard work, by being the role model, by being the best ambassador of the cuisine and the culture that you came from. When I leave Canada, I am the best unappointed ambassador of this country. When I go down to the States or I go to Germany or anywhere else, I become the best unappointed ambassador. Once that finishes, I am in Canada the best unappointed ambassador of India because of the country that I left behind. So you, you must always hone your skills in best of the kitchens, best of the places, but you must also take chances. Because unless you take chances, how are you going to get anywhere? You need to risk it. And so what? We came empty handed in this world. We're going to go empty handed. Not a single human being in this world has taken anything with them. Even the king that built the Taj Mahal left the Taj Mahal behind. So why are you so worried? Take the plunge. So what? Start all over again. But you need to have that, you know, that heart to do it. Have to have the guts to do it. Have to have the desire to do it. Passion is in everything you've said today and in everything you seem to be doing. Is passion important? Passion is, I think, the most important thing. Passion and focus. You can have a great passion, but you need to have the focus, the tenacity to survive and work hard at what you do and make right choices and right moves. Passion is that, that fire that fuels and that, that burns inside you that constantly wants you to do something. But you still have to fan that fire. That fanning of that fire has to come from time, from tenacity, from hard work. And then eventually that beautiful glow will warm you up, warm your heart up, off the fire. Is that, is that crucial to success? Every, every element is crucial to success. Every element. Not a single element in this world is not crucial. The moment that I'm even sitting with you here today is extremely crucial for the su success of anything that we do. Whether I do whatever I do on, on Saturday. Every moment is important. And never should you think, ah, this, this is not important, that's not important. It's like relationships. You never burn down your relationships. You never burn down. Nobody should ever say he or she was such a bad person. You should say, well, things didn't work out. But he's not a bad person or she's not a bad person. That's important. I think passion, I think passion is, is important. But it's not just the only thing required. You need so many different elements. If there's a fire that's burning, it needs the logs, it needs the oxygen, it needs the space to breathe, it needs somebody to enjoy it, to fan it, to look at it, to you know, to tender it. It's that's that's important. So if that fire is going to continue to burn, it needs all these different elements. So for you to continue to burn, you need a lot of these elements around you in order to, to perform. You know, I could sit here waxing poetic with you probably all day, but I know you do have a very busy schedule this weekend. I have to get down to the nitty gritty. Yeah. Chaat papri or gogo? Oh my god. <laughs> that's, that's like you asking me which of my two daughters do I like better. <laughs> I'm sure you secretly like one of them. <laughs> no, I love no, them both. Um, okay, so Golgappa 
reminds me of that street food um, that you're getting the gold guppas from the guy. The hands are dirty. The guy is like going like this, and you're, he's still putting it, his hands in the sauce, and that hygiene is just thrown out. And when you ate 10 of those Golgappas, you knew that your stomach was going to be upset the next day. You knew it fully well. You were fine with it. But you were fine with it. You're like, I'll suffer tomorrow morning. But right now, it's the best mouth orgasm that I've ever had. Mm -hmm. And that's the important part. Papri chaat is a classic, delicate part where you put little papri, you know, aloo sabji on top of it and, 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 and you know, and it's crisps and stuff. Papri chaat is elegant. Gulgappas are a little bit like rough, like it's like, so it just depends. Alu paratha or gobi paratha? Oi, oi, yes. you're taking it too far, Sudhat. <laughs> I have to know, I think this is what people want to know, really. Um, gobi paratha, because it's tougher to make gobi paratha, because the gobi has to be very finely cut, spiced up, rolled up in such a way, and you have to be very delicate with it. So when you eat that gobi paratha with some dahi and nachar, it's like, wow, delicious, you know the effort. Alu paratha, potatoes, because they have starch, they stick to it and it works easier. But an alu paratha that's packed in a lunch box and you're eating it in a cold day somewhere, is far better. Because gobi paratha will not taste as good. So garam garam goli, uh, gobi parathas, right coming out there, yeah. unbelievable. Okay. But alu paratha, you have to give them the respect that they are the most delicious thing with achar uh, when you're camping or being somewhere else. So you're in Toronto. If you had to pack a tiffin for John Tory, what three <laughs> items are you going to put in? You know what I would actually do for him? Um, in a tiffin box, this is what I would do. I would make him a dal, which is the lentils. Mm -hmm. I will give him some saag and paneer, which is classic. And I give him a bottle of red wine with it. Nice. Naan and roti are going to be part of that anyway. So, so saag, which is spinach and paneer, dal, and a bottle of red wine. Those were my three things because they all match and they're all delicious and it's comfort food. After that, he can go and do whatever he wants in his life. <laughs> okay. Um, now, you're here for the Hot and Spicy Food Festival this weekend. Can't wait to see you on stage there. And if you want to spice up a dish, are you going to use cayenne? Are you going to use um, crushed chili flakes? Are you going to use hearty merch? What do you use? So, I, uh, <clears throat> I can make anything hot and spicy. <laughs> um, but what, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to actually watch the audience and I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball at, uh, at people. And the curveball is going to be that I'm during my talk, I'm going to uh, throw out keywords and I'm going to ask four people the same keywords if they've, they've answered that. And what's going to happen is if they paid attention to what I had to talk, they would get a chance to come up and taste the food that I've cooked for them. Can you make a note of that, please? <laughs> um, and uh, uh, how am I going to spice it up? I think I'm going to just watch. I'm going to see what, what I feel like doing that day. How am I? I'm not going to add either cayenne or chili for the sake of doing it. As I said to you, I don't sit there and think about it now. I do it when I feel like it. The curtains are drawn, you perform. Sometimes your lines are delivered this way and sometimes your lines are delivered this way. You ask any decent musician in the world, he'll say to you, if he sang the same song again after five minutes, it'll be different than the song that he sang. It cannot be exact. That's how cooking is supposed to be. I don't know right now how it's going to end up. I don't know. Maybe I'll totally mess it up. Maybe I'll burn the hell out of the onions and it'll be like, Shit, this is burnt chicken. Doubt that's going to happen. But I guess for everyone to find out what will happen, they'll have to check you out. Hot and Spicy Food Festival happening this weekend in Toronto. And uh, before I let you go, butter chicken, guys, forget the butter chicken. Vikram Vid is going to tell you what he wants you to eat next time you eat Indian. You know what pancakes are to a white person is what butter chicken is to us Indians. Yeah. It's like so generic. Nothing wrong with it, but it's so generic. Do me a favor, guys. Indian food is so versatile, so democratic, so different. Try and venture out of the box of having butter chicken only and chicken tikka masala.
respect your heritage, respect your culture, and enjoy different kinds of Indian foods. A homemade simple chicken curry made with sour cream, or with uh, yogurt, or with whipping cream, anything else. There's so many other stuff, so many other Indian dishes that your mother makes. Sometimes you don't need to give names to things. Mm -hmm. You can just make them, okay. right? Sometimes you don't need to say, what is this called? Just, if I come to your house and you make a delicious dal and a sabji, who cares what it's called? As long as it's made with love and passion, who cares? You could serve me a simplest dal and I'll be like, this is delicious. Okay right? guys, so I have homework to do. Gonna prepare a menu next time he's in town and we'll have you over for dinner. Thank you so much for being with me My today. pleasure. And thank you all for watching. You can all catch Vikram this Saturday at 2 p.m. at the Harbor Front Center. The Hot and Spicy Food Festival is in town and he's sure to bring the heat.